Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Laura Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, um, Tuesday morning, September 20th. This is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another. We're on for 30 minutes. I'm sorry, we're on for an hour. I changed that to an hour, actually. Um, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. So we're on for an hour this morning, so you know everybody can sit back and grab a coffee or whatever. Um, I appreciate everybody tuning into the shows. You know, like I started this November 2009 and didn't have any idea how long I'd be doing these shows, and um, you know which where how how I was actually going to you know incorporate my stuff into it. But it all just sort of evolved into this. So um, hopefully somebody's getting something out of this. I know I am. Uh, this is my healing journey here in the morning. Really, one child survivor to another. So are my other shows, but this one is really looking at the process and looking at what I'm going through and and what I'm looking at and dealing with on a regular basis. So I appreciate everybody spending the time with me. That's awesome. You know, I just um, I just want to continue on looking at inner child healing work because that's really right where I'm at in my healing journey. And um, you know, it's I like to stay tuned into it because it is a lot of work. Um, going through all that inner child healing, the process of processing and all this. And Robert Bernie's web pages is awesome. Like, he's got some great stuff there. And uh, if you go to www.joy to me in U.S., www.joy, the number two, meu.com, you can bring up his index and you can see he's got all kinds of stuff there on codependency, inner child healing, um, relationship stuff. And he's a, Robert Bernie is a codependent therapist. He's a grief counselor, he's a he's a spiritual teacher, he's an author, he's written a book called Codependence, The Dance of Wounded Souls, which is an amazing book, and his web pages are awesome. So we've been on his web pages for a long time, and that's just because that's what I'm dealing with, right? So, you know, hopefully everybody's getting something out of this, like I said, I appreciate it. You know, you have to listen at your own discretion. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm talking about abuse, and abuse is a sensitive subject, and if you're not quite, you know, that far along in your healing journey... You know, this type of material, anything like this can trigger you. You have to you have to be aware of what you're okay to listen to. And if you think abuse topics might bother you, you know, talking about abuse of all types, right, um, you need to turn the show off, right? That's your discretion. So listen at your own discretion. Young young people under the age of 18, I just ask that you have permission to listen to my shows because, you know, I don't know who's listening to the shows and I don't know how young the people are who are listening. And So you have to, if you're under age of 18, just have an adult listen to the show with you so that they can help you make a decision you know, whether or not it's age appropriate for you, because my shows are not for younger children. And so you need to make, you know, take care of yourself and you need to, to make good choices for yourself. So if you're under 18, just have an adult listen with you and they can help you make a decision whether or not to listen. So thanks, everybody. We'll get right into this. And, you know, I just appreciate everybody, like I said, being here. And I did change the, the form. I did change it up a bit. You know, I was doing shows Monday through Friday in the morning at uh, 6 o'clock, and that's because I was getting ready for work, you know. And um, it's really the last two years. And so it just seemed like a good time for me to do this show first thing in the morning and um, then start my day and I off I go to work and whatever. But I've been off work like for three months now, almost three months, in between contracts. My contract ended and I'm, I work contract normally and so I haven't I haven't really got any work yet. So I thought, well, I'll just switch it up a little bit and just do an hour show on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And it uh, gives me an opportunity to do a little bit more Really, first of all, to sleep in because I'm really exhausted, and also uh, to do some more work on my inner child healing because that takes time. Like that's what I, I will be kind of talking about here is my inner child healing process, like what I'm actually doing to work with my inner children because I, I knew I had a, an issue going on inside. It was a lot of rage and a lot of anger, and I could, and I knew it was me from a long time ago. You know, this wounded child, right, <clears throat> growing up in an abusive home, and. Um, I, I knew I had a lot of work to do, but I didn't know until I actually started looking at inner child healing. Um, I didn't realize I had more than one um, point, you know, where my inner children sort of all suffered these these traumas and got stuck, you know, at these different places. When I started actually looking into it, I actually had a whole bunch of inner children who needed a lot of help, and that was me from so long ago, right? And um, so I started searching out how to actually, you know, how to how to how to reach those inner children, you know, to, to um, first of all, to to get myself to feel better about my past, you know, um, and also, you know, to grieve those wounds. I hadn't really ever grieved those wounds um, from being abused as a child, and I needed to learn how to go back in there and get in touch with them. I still haven't grieved the wounds, but at least I have gotten in touch with them, and I've gotten, done some work, you know, to see 
um, it, what it does is it allows me to go back and get a clearer picture of what was happening at the time, and you know, from you know, four years old, five years old, even infancy, right? And um, so it is a little distressing, and it takes time to do it. You know, to go back and look at those um, those painful memories, right? Um, it do, it doesn't happen like you know I can't do it in five minutes and then off I go to do something else. Like it takes the, really the other day I was working on inner child healing work. Uh, I mean, actually, I do it every day. But yesterday I was working on it for for just a short time. But the day before um, on uh, Sunday, I was working on it for pretty well most of the day. And so that's the sort of thing. It just for me, you know, I don't know about anybody else, but it's taking me quite a while to, to do this stuff and process what I need to process. And what I'm doing is working through um, John Bradshaw's Homecoming, which is his book on inner child healing. It's called Reclaiming and Healing Your Inner Child, and I'm actually going through it. It's a workbook. And, um, you know, when you go, if you actually get those books, which I, I was lucky and I got, got, got to get a hold of a copy of those of his books, um, you can see there's a whole process involved, right? So we'll be going through some of that just to sort of talk about what's been going on with the what I've discovered in my inner child healing work. And I've been doing some inner child healing work with a friend of mine who is, um, she helps survivors. She has some material from Beverly Cyril out of uh, Australia. And it's a, it's a, to do with visualizations. And so we've been working through those for about, I'd say, a couple months, you know, more, maybe three months or so. Pretty well since I've been off work through, from my contract work. So that's been helping a lot as well because what I did it, it created a safe place for for my inner children so that they would, so just to get them to safety because I realized that some of my inner children were still in the same pain and agony that they were in during these different points where I was abused as a child right and so it's pretty horrific so you know if you're going to do this work for this healing work um, especially inner child healing work you know. <laughs> going back and looking at the original source of the wounding and stuff like this, you know, where you were abused and what happened. And, I mean, it literally takes you back into the rooms. You have to go back into the rooms. You have to you have to see what happened to yourself. You know, like, if you're doing this work, you got to be careful, you know. And I'm okay to do it on my own. The reason why is because I know I'm not going to hurt myself. I'm not going to, I'm not going to hurt other people, you know, because I'm, or I'm not going to spiral downward, backward into my, you know, regress through my healing journey. Um, and the reason I know that is because I've I've been working on it long enough to know, you know, like I've been on my healing journey four and a half years, and so I'm quite a well way through. So that's the thing, you know. I think it's a lifelong process, but I feel a lot better than I did four and a half years ago. I tell you, but um, you know, so I know that I'm okay to do this work on my own. But you have to be careful. Like I've seen all kinds of material out there, especially on. Uh, on uh, the ASCA site, the Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, a, a more a more center program, www.ascasupport, S-C-P-P-O-R-T, ascasupport.org. They have a Survivor to Thriver workbook on there. It's a manual, and you can download it. It's free, and um, or you can just read it right on their site. And they, the first 35 pages are safety first, just talking about how, you know, a survivor of abuse, you know, especially child abuse, needs to be safe before you do the work. You have to know that you're going to be safe and that you're not going to hurt yourself and that you've got the appropriate tools and and, and appropriate support mechanisms in place uh, when you're going through the work, right? Because it can be very, very uh, daunting and very scary. You have to go back and look at the original source of the pain and and grieve these wounds and stuff. I haven't done a whole lot of grieving of, of, of these wounds, which I will be doing, but what I'm doing right now is just getting in touch with, with all this stuff, right? So... So yeah, you got to be careful for sure because it does stir up some stuff. Like it, just looking at, at just the other day when I was working on this on Sunday, stirred up all kinds of stuff that I had forgotten about. You know, it wasn't that I forgot about it. It's just I put it in the back of my mind. It's obviously memories that were there, but I just didn't wasn't thinking about them. And then when I was done, it, I realized that I had all kinds of uh, um, not negative, but just sad feelings about it because I was looking at I, I was actually working on saving my and, and reclaiming my inner toddler, infant and toddler in the last week. So, infancy and toddler, you know, looking back at what I what I actually was missing, you know what I mean, through growing up in this abusive home and the environment that that I grew up in, and I thought it's no wonder I'm so screwed up, you know, or that I was. I actually feel so much better than I than I ever did. But, you know, it's really no wonder that children end up the way that they do, and then adults end up having to deal with this stuff. You know, growing up in some of these really abusive environments is absolutely horrific. But that's what I mean. You got to be careful when you're doing this stuff because it can stir up emotions and feelings that are pretty painful, 
if you don't have anybody around and, and you're used to having somebody around to support you through it, you got to be careful doing it on your own. You know, and if you're used to having a therapist or a counselor involved, it's probably best to keep it that way until you know for sure. You know, for sure, for sure that you can do it on your own, right? So, and a good way to check that out is to look through that that Survivor to Thriver workbook uh, from Adult Survivors of Child Abuse and just check out the first 35 pages of that Safety First, uh, looking at what's, there's all kinds of questions you can ask yourself and it does give you an idea whether or not you are safe enough to do inner child healing work or anything like that. So it is good stuff. So I have some good friends here in the chat room. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> I got my gypsy witch here with me and some guests and appreciate you all being here. So we're picking up back up at Robert Bernie's web pages here, the recovery process for inner child healing. And this is the second part of what we were looking at last uh, last week, actually. The process of processing part two. And uh, we finished off the part one there. And so now we're just looking at part two. And part two is really just a bunch of, uh, it's sort of just choppy. It's just bits and pieces of what he wanted to throw throw in there. He says, this page contains quotes from different sources that I think may add some extra levels of perspective to the series of articles about the inner child healing process. That include that concludes with the process of processing articles. So, really, we're pretty well done with the inner child healing work. We've pretty well gone through this whole thing in the last three months. Um, he says I have deviated a little bit here in terms of the text color um, that I normally use to distinguish between quotes from different sources because it was just too much on a page that is all quotes. <laughs> so he's he's just talking about that. He says the pro the recovery process for inner child healing, the process of processing too. Um, this is from an excerpt from Inter- Energetic Clarity probably one of his articles. He's got all kinds of stuff on here. He's got some great stuff. So he says, and I want to make a point right at the beginning of this article that this is a gradual process of finding a sense of balance, not an absolute destination. So he says, the language I have used to describe this multi-leveled, multifaceted growth process is very limiting. Um, because the, during the process of processing part one, that was really what he was talking about, was this whole idea of finding balance. And once we we, we're always changing, so within six months, you know, we're going to have to rebalance, right? And the behaviors and, and the decisions that we've been making, even in the last six months, you know, we have to kind of work with, especially survivors of abuse who have grown up with dysfunctional belief systems and dis- dysfunctional um, behaviors, you know, we have to, we're continually learning, continually growing, as long as we're looking in and actually do, we're doing some work on it. And then we have to rebalance <clears throat> our emotions and rebalance our feelings. And it's just a rebalancing all the time. So it's quite interesting to see what he has to say about that. And he says, he says, unfortunately, in sharing this information, I'm forced to use language that is polarized, that is black and white. When I say that you cannot truly love others unless you love yourself, that does not mean that you have to completely love yourself first before you can start to love others, he says. And the way the process works is that every time we learn to love and accept ourselves a little tiny bit more, we also gain the capacity to love and accept others a little tiny bit more. And so he says, when I say that you cannot start to access intuitive truth until you clear out your inner channel, I'm not saying that you have to complete your healing process before you can start getting me- messages. Uh, you you can start getting messages as soon as you're willing to start listening. And the more you heal, the clearer the messages become. So that's interesting. Um, yeah, I guess so, really. I mean, that's like me. I mean, I was... It was just, you know, it's like saying, okay, I'll start to heal as soon as I'm done looking at all the information. <laughs> you know, that would be like, okay, I'll start to heal in the next, um, as soon as I'm healing here, at about looking at the healing work in about 10 years, I'll start to heal. That's not true because as I'm going through it, I'm a little bit, little bit healing here and there, a little bit more progress made, you know, and so it, it is changing all the time. So I, I understand what he's saying. Excerpt from uh, Grief, Love, and Fear of Intimacy. We actually looked at all that. But he says, that poor little boy, it wasn't until almost 30 years later, leaning up against the side of the meeting room, that I got the chance to cry for that little boy. With great heaving sobs, tears pouring down my cheeks, and and, and snot running out of my nose, I had my first experience with deep grief work. So he's talking about his own process, right? He says, I did not know anything about the process at the time. I just knew that somehow that wounded little boy was still alive inside of me. I also did not know at that time that part of my life's work was going to be helping other people to reclaim the wounded little boys and girls inside of them. So he says, now I know that emotions are energy which, if not released in a healthy grieving process, get stuck in the body. And the only way for me to start healing my wounds is to go back to that little boy and cry the tears or own the rage that he had no permission to own back then. So he says, I also know that there are layers of grief from the emotional trauma I experienced. And there is not only trauma about what happened back then, 
<clears throat> excuse me, there's also grief about the effect those experiences had on me later in life. So I get to cry once again for that little boy as I write this. I have been sobbing for that little boy and the emotional trauma he experienced, but I'm also sobbing for the man that I became. This is very interesting, and this is very true. I mean, um, you know, looking back, at like I mean, looking at what my process through this about four and a half years now, you know, when I'm doing my, you know, looking at, at, at what I was forced to endure as a child, you know, like I'm not only grieving for, for myself as a young person, but also what, what it turned me into as an adult. And, um, you know, because, I mean, I started out a little innocent child, right? Um, I didn't. I didn't start out with this bad attitude. You know what I mean? A lot of people might think, "Man, she's cranky," but you know, I didn't start out this way. <laughs> you know, I started out an innocent child who I had love in my heart. You know, I, just automatically, unconditional love. You know, for for my family, right? For my, for especially for my mother, and that whole motherly thing. You know, and uh, that was all changed. You know, and I didn't change it. Like. You know what I mean? Like, it's, I, by the time I was ten years old, I just wanted to be dead. I was like, just kill me, somebody just, just freaking kill me. You know, get me out of this mess. And that ten years—that's all it took. It took my parents and my and, my, and sibling ten years to literally kill my spirit and kill my soul and kill every part of me. You know what I mean? I was still just walking around like a walking shell. You know, so many kids I know, so many people have have gone through that. So many people can probably identify with that. Um. You know, that's I, I think about that. And it really bothers me because I'm like, man, you know, how could they do that to me? You know, like, and then I was forced to walk around for the rest of my life with this knowledge, and there's no way I can go back to being that innocent little little child. See, I can't ever go back and get that. I can't go back and get what I, I can't go back and change that. And that, that's that's the reality is that I, I can pretend all I want. And I can be in denial all I want, and I can just pretend, and oh, everything's great, and, you know. But the, but that's just not reality. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, is it affected every area of my life, you know. And so, it affected my personality. It literally changed my brain, you know. And so that's what abuse will do, you know. Psychological, emotional abuse is thrown in, you know, on top of physical abuse and child sexual abuse. I mean, my God. Is bound to have a profound effect on the brain, you know, on the physio part of the brain, you know, where where it's fight or flight, and you have, you know, my fight or flight reactions actually took over my life because I was in a constant, steady stream of fight or flight for so many years. So it changed the way my brain chemistry worked, you know, and so I became a bitter person because I was. Because I was no longer this happy little innocent child, you know, and I saw and I witnessed too much and I endured too much and had to see too much, um, and then was told just to shut up and sit there and take it, you know. I wasn't able to express any of my feelings and wasn't able to express any love or any care. wasn't able to express any any joy, you know. Even though I mean I was allowed to play, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine last night, Gypsy Witch, and you know, like I, I was allowed to play. I had coloring books, I had toys, you know. My mom bought me toys and stuff. Like some children don't don't even get that. I got toys. I got beat on. I, mean, I got sexually used, but I got toys. And so you know, it's I got to play, but I never got to play as an innocent child. That's the issue. I was able to play. I had toys, but I could never really relax into my childhood and just enjoy being a child and enjoy that freedom and that that you know. I think so many children. I mean, I know there's so many people out here who've been abused. I know this. Um, can relate to that, you know. Like, I mean, I got to play, but it, it was not the right kind of play. It was not going to ever be what it should have been. You know, and so going back now, doing some of my inner child healing work, really, I mean, I bought a coloring book and some crayons and just, you know, because my inner wounded child at seven years old wanted me to get some crayons and coloring books and color with her, so I've started to do that. And what it does is really cool because it takes me back to that age. Uh, it allows me to be her again. And, but it allows me to be her with the knowledge that I'm safe, that I'm okay, you know, that things turned out okay. I'm actually alive, you know, I'm I'm taking pretty good care of myself. Like, these are things that I never did before. You know, I was a drug user until I was 21 and thought I was going to really just die a violent death until I was about 25. And, um, just, you know, horrible, horrible lifestyle. And then, you know, just just really struggling through, all the way through up until today. But actually, I'm doing actually quite well. Um, you know what I mean? Just just making it. So she sees that, you know, things are getting better and 
my inner child, my inner self from so long ago needs to see that, you know. Um, they need to see some safety, some security somewhere. That's me from so long ago. And I basically have to reparent myself, you know, and, and and redo this whole mess, you know. There's no way I can ever change the past, but I can definitely um, show myself the love and respect and that I cer- that I certainly deserved as a child. And I'm really the only one that can go in there and reach those children because I know who they are and where they are. These are myself at different points. So it is helping. Like, it totally is helping to do this work, uh, you know. But it is a long process. It hasn't certainly isn't happening overnight, you know. But he says, so, so he says, you know, these, these layers of grief, you know, from this emotional trauma that he experienced, not only about what he went through as a child, but what it turned him into as a man, you know. And this is just it. You know, I sit around and I think, I look at myself today and I know I'm the end result. People would say, oh, that's not true, but it is so true. I'm the end result of what my parents and, and my, my of my past. We all are, of our past experiences. And the sad thing, I mean, part of myself I celebrate all the time because I like my, I like the ability that my parents couldn't kill me. <laughs> I really do. I give myself a pat on the back for that, you know, because they tried, you know, and they couldn't do it. They tried to really kill me. Like, I mean, honestly, like not only physically, but but spiritually in every other way. They tried to spiritually kill me. And actually, when I was 10, I thought I was dead. I thought I was spiritually dead. That's how I felt. But, you know, I got that back, you know, and that's great. That's four and a half years ago, and you know that's my redemption. I actually wrote about it in my book, Life of Death Redemption. But um, they couldn't kill me, right? So I do, I do celebrate some of the stuff that you know. It's not like I'm completely down on myself. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I celebrate a lot of things. You know that that because it's true. You know what I mean? That it takes a certain amount of uh, stubbornness and a certain amount of strength to come back fighting from something like that. You know. Whereas if I wouldn't remain in denial like my sister, then it would be okay. <clears throat> because my sister's in denial, which is the only way she can be. She's DID. And you know, so she can't she can't face anything because it it would crush her. It would totally crush her. But I've been able to face this stuff head on. You know, I mean I I mean I would I actually looked at my abusers in the face and told them exactly what I felt. And this was when I was younger. And even my abuser dad who's still living, well, my most of my abusers are dead, but my, my dad is still living. And I thought, I just told him like it was. I said, you hurt me, you know, and you hurt my mother, you hurt my family, and you expect me to be able to just sit here and be be your daughter, you know. It's like, you know, no, you, you screwed up, you know. So it was great being able to do that, but it's not everybody can do that, you know what I mean. Uh, he knows I wrote my book, he knows what I'm doing, right, I mean, and what, what can he do? Truth is truth, right? But this is just it, you know. I celebrate my some of my stuff, like you know, that I feel that I've accomplished, which is just staying alive. Staying, <laughs> staying alive for me is a big issue because I wanted to kill myself for so many years, you know. And I thought, well, if I don't die from a drug overdose when I was younger, because that's really what it was all about when I was young, um, you know, or, or die in the street from some sort of drug deal gone bad or whatever, or get killed by some violent act of some sort of random violent act because I was hanging around with duty drug users and we were just living this lifestyle that was pretty horrible when I was young, you know. And then by the time I hit about 21, 22, that all changed because I decided I wanted a decent life, you know. So I started to take care of myself and got off the drugs, right. But the thing is, is like, you know, uh, through that, you know, I, I used to think that my life was just going to end that way. It was going to end some violent death because it started out violent and I thought that's just the way it's going to go. So I actually celebrate the fact that I'm drug free except for cigarettes. You know, like I smoke cigarettes, but that's my only vice. I don't even do prescription drugs. I absolutely do no drugs. I live with my pain. I tolerate my pain. I don't take Tylenol, nothing, you know. I got teeth rotting out of my head. <laughs> yeah, I got pain, but, you know, I'm like, no, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this all myself, you know. And so once in a while I have to break down and take some Tylenol or something like that. But but it's very rare because I really refuse to do it. I'm just like, no, I'm too stubborn. And uh, I just want to face this thing head on, you know, because I don't want to get older. I'm going to need heavy-duty pain pills. That's why. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'm not taking them now because I know I'm going to need them later. But um, this is the thing, you know, like I celebrate a lot of stuff. It's not like I'm completely down on myself. But the issue is, is I look at my personality and I look at the, I look at the, uh, at what they did to me. They took away my innocence. They stole, they stole everything from me. My parents and my brother. You know, like my mom stole everything from me first. 
because she would never she didn't give me any love she didn't give me any any care or regard for my body for my mind for my for my for my being she didn't she wanted me dead she said oh, I, you should have died with the other stillborn babies you know and like she would she would say these horrible things to me when i was a little kid and you know this is the stuff that i'm going to have to go back through when i'm when i'm working with my inner child inner child work especially preschool and then school age and adolescence where this stuff's going to get very painful because i've I've been talking about this now for two years on my shows, but it doesn't mean I've done any of the emotional work with it. I haven't. <laughs> I've been talking about it. That's just fine. <laughs> you know, I can talk about it, no problem. But when it comes to actually doing the work of allowing myself to feel the feelings, I'm not feeling the feelings on this show. You know what I mean? Like in the mornings when I do these shows, I'm not feeling the feelings at all. What I, I maybe a little bit of anger, as people can tell in my voice, because anger does come out. But I, I have no problem getting angry. Uh, anger is one of the emotions that I actually will allow myself to show. But as far as the other stuff is like what it really did to me, you know what I mean? All the stuff that my mother did to me, my dad mainly, my my two, my, my parents were my main abusers. But then one of my brothers sexually used me when I was eight years old, raped and, and violated, you know. And so I have to go back and redo all that, re re look at it. I have to be my. I have to actually put myself there. And then rescue myself from that point and actually um, comfort that child. But first I have to see it and feel it and grieve it. So I haven't done any of that, see, not not properly. So this is where it gets pretty harsh, you know, because, you know, that that's what allows me to see now, you know, what they did to me. You know, not only physically. You know, I haven't really done the greatest job of looking after my physical body. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't shown how to do it as a child. None of, none of, none of my family ever really ever has been able to look after themselves physically because my parents didn't do that, right? Because my parents were physically violent towards each other, never taking care of their own bodies or their own selves, and also hurting each other and trying to kill each other. So, you know, it wasn't like they cared about their own physical bodies or anyone else's in the family. So... None of us learned how to, how, to, how to actually take care of ourselves. And so it's kind of bizarre, but it's true. And two of my siblings killed themselves, and one of my other sisters was always trying to kill herself. And One of my other sisters is in denial, so she, she does all right. <laughs> She's the one who's DID. She's the one that does all right, actually. But see, at some point, will she ever, will she ever face it? Who knows? You know, I don't know. It's, she's She's just got her own issues. And then one of my brothers is just kind of the type that's like, you know what, it's done, it's over, I don't want to pick it back up, I'm not looking at it, but he's, he's at the end of his life, 60-odd years old, really, I mean, he's not that healthy, and, you know, he's in the last stages of his years, and I don't think he wants to deal with it, so he's just like, whatever, so I've only got, like, two siblings left, right? But none of us really could look after ourselves, you know? And, um, so now as an adult, I mean, some of the stuff that I've done to my body has been for me, you know, continuing to smoke for, like, I started smoking when I was 12, you know, <laughs> but not cigarettes, <laughs> so I'll just tell you that. But, I mean, I was smoking, like, steady from 12 right on up until today, you know, and, I mean, I shouldn't be smoking. I have a heart defect and just this whole, you know, issue with my whole body just not being looked after as a child. Um, I've had, you know, lots of problems. I actually did a show talking about the physical problems from the abuse that I suffered. I did that, I did that show Friday night, but... These are the issues, you know, I got to look at this stuff. I have to face me every morning. You know? I got to face who I am. I got to face my attitudes. I got to I got to face my belief systems every morning when I wake up. We all do. We get up with the day. Some people may not think about it as much as I do, but that's because I'm on my healing journey. I'm trying to help myself. So, that, you know what I mean? Like four and a half years ago, I decided that I was just not going to kill myself. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Four and a half years ago, it took me to the age of 40 years old, you know, to figure out that I'm not going to kill myself. I mean, wow, you know what I mean? So four and a half years is not very long in the scale of things. And I've been working steady for it for that whole time, really. So I've only been off, like, this is the longest I've ever been off between contracts, you know. So yeah, it's a pretty long time for me to be off, which is great because I've been able to do so much of the work, you know, the healing work. But, you know, I have to look at myself every day in the mirror and know that I'm the end result of a whole lot of abuse and garbage and horrible stuff. But on the inside, part of me is still that innocent child, you know, like part of me is still still that good person that I that I that I am. You know, like I'm not a bad person. I don't you know I don't uh, intentionally hurt people, you know. Sometimes I hurt people and do stupid things. Obviously nobody's perfect, right? And I have to, you know, try to make amends and things, you know, nobody's perfect. 
but I'm not a bad person. I'll go around, you know, just trying to hurt people intentionally and, you know, or, you know, I try to take care of myself. I don't do the greatest job of that, but I'm actually working on it. But it, but it's not that, that stuff that I'm looking at. It's this belief system, you know, that my parents set up for me, you know. And that's that's hard to change because it was, it's like almost like it was, um, you know, imprinted on my brain, you know. This belief system that I'm lesser than, that I'm lower than, that I that I should have died when I was a baby, <laughs> that, that, that my mother should have killed me because she was quite often telling me that. And that, you know, she wished I hadn't ever been born. And she used to tell me all kinds of horrible things. And um, she blamed me because my brother sexually assaulted me and, and raped me and sodomized me. She actually blamed me for that. I was eight years old. He was 21. I mean, what was I supposed to do? You know, like... It's absolutely ridiculous. She wouldn't even get me any help. She just let him continue to sexually use me. She just allowed it. She wasn't standing there watching. She knew he was doing this, and she didn't get me any help. You know, she didn't. She didn't help me at all. Right. But my mother was my main abuser, who was trying to kill me all the time. So it's really no wonder. She just, she just probably and my, like I was saying on many shows. Actually, most people have listening have been listening for the last few months. You know, I mean, my mother was being sexually abused right by my dad. And so she just figured, well, I'm getting sexually abused, so you're getting sexually abused. Too bloody bad. Because that was her attitude. You know, my, like, because my dad was beating on her, and then she would beat on me. And I would be, what do you want me to do about this? Look at my face. Look what you did to me. You know? Like, look what you did to my nose. My mother would, like, rearrange my face, you know? And, and uh, you know, she would sit there and she'd go, I don't care. Too bad. I have to take this. You have to take it. That was her attitude. You know, she was just like, you, I'm, I'm getting beat on. You're getting beat on. Right? I mean, how pathetic and how sick and twisted can you be? I mean, to a little child, that is ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous, especially because I was her, her protector. I was the one that wanted to, that, did, that didn't want, that I didn't like to see my dad hurting my mother, you know? And really, I mean, not, none of my siblings actually cared for my dad, really. Um, the really, none of us actually bonded with my dad. None of us liked him at all. And we used to wish that he would die. We'd all be sitting around going, how can we take care of this problem? Like, some of my older siblings were like, Mom, you should just kill him. Just kill him. You know, or we'll do it for you. So then I heard that, and I started to say that. And I, this is how I grew up. This is exactly it. This is truthful. This is 100% truth. Like, I mean, my dad was just so incredibly bad. But he was a Christian, and he looked so good on the outside. Oh, yeah. Spotless. You know, white suit, walking around, old pious Mr. Christian Matt, you know. And, and you know, the siblings and myself and my mother were just like, you know, my mom was like, well, we can't kill him. He's just sick. And I'm like, you know, I would, when I, by the time I got old enough to actually realize what my siblings were talking about, my older brothers, uh, then I started to tell my mom, this is right around the age of 12, 13, I was like, yeah, just kill him. You know, <laughs> we'll, we'll help you. We'll take him out. You know what I mean? Um, that's really, really pathetic, sick and sad and wrong. But the thing is, is my mother used to bash him in the head so hard with like lamps and stuff because he'd be coming at her. And he, he wouldn't fall. He wouldn't, you know, he you couldn't phase him. You could hit him in the head as hard as you wanted to. And he would get back up and he would come after you. He was like the devil. You know, honest to God, when I was growing up, I thought he was the devil. Because he kept coming and he kept coming and there was no way of stopping him. But he's psychologically ill. He's schizophrenic, right? And so I used to think he was the devil. I was like, you can't kill this guy. You know, my mother used to try, but it just didn't work, you know. And, of course, it didn't help because then he would beat the shit out of her, right, or beat the shit out of me or whoever was in the way. So, you know, this is the thing, right? I mean, I, I look at this stuff and I'm like, look what they did to me, you know. Like, they, I can't go back and be an innocent person that doesn't know about horror and pain. I can't go back and be this you know, this person on the planet that doesn't know about somebody sexually using children and somebody raping, you know, I won't, like my dad raped my mother in front of me when I was a little girl, right? And so, you know, then, what, three, four years later, my brother was raping me. Um, you know, this is horrific, right? Like, no child should ever have to deal with that, you know? No child. But yet, look how many children on the planet deal with it every day. Um, and this is actually, it's so incredibly wrong. It's so incredibly damaging. And it's like, you know, I look at this stuff and I'm like, that's me, you know, because I'm not in denial. I can see this whole thing, you know. And so it did affect my whole being. It affected the way I think. It affected the way, it, it affected my relationships in every way, you know. It affected my whole life, you know. And so when I looked at my dad just recently, because he came over, he, he he actually, you know, I cut my family off like almost two years ago now, thank God. But, um, or at least a year and a half ago. 
but he snuck over and snuck in because my my sweetheart just moved in with me because he's terminally ill. He's been terminally ill for a long time, but he he was in the hospital dying, and they told him, well, you know, he didn't want to go home back to his place where he was staying. He's like, because he was staying in like a simple care place, and he's like, I want to go be with my sweetheart. I want to be. I want to spend my last days with my with the love of my life, right? They were like, well, okay. So he moved back in with me, and which is awesome because we lived together for many years, and um, we've been together for 16 years. And it's because he's on his last legs unless he gets a transplant. But they keep telling him he's only got a couple months or a couple weeks. Well, you know, at some point, a couple of days. But he, he just keeps going and going and going. He's like an inner dryer's or bunny. It's awesome because, you know, it's great. But the thing is, is um, you know, he moved in with me and didn't realize, you know, that he wasn't supposed to let my dad in. Because I told him not to let my family in. But he thought it was me at the door. So he opened the door and here comes my dad, right, 88 years old. <laughs> I told my dad, uh, when I came home, I was really upset that he was in my place. I'm like, oh, God, I kicked him out. and I, It's not that I kicked him out. I kicked him out of my life. I told them all that I, I'm done with him, you know. And here I have to deal with him, you know, and he's 88. He's, he's, he's sort of, you know, he's got a little bit of that dementia going on. And, you know, he's 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 just the same old 88-year-old abuser dad that I ever had. It's just that he's too old to do anything, you know. And so he's sitting there in my living room, and he's like, I didn't know if I'd ever see you again. And I'm like, well, look. You know, I cut you guys off for a reason, you know, <laughs> because I'm not doing denial anymore. I'm not, I can't do, look what you did to me. I said, you have, you and mother, you and mom, and, and Rob have you created this horrible mess for me that I'm still dealing with at the age of 45, 46 years old, of pain and misery and wanting to kill myself and not being able to cope, not being able to handle things. You created that for me, you know. I said, why should I want to hang around with you guys? You're, you're all doing denial. You're all pretending it was all okay. You know, forget that. You know, I can't do that anymore, right? Like, I'm on my healing journey. I'm facing this stuff. This is truth for me. It's, it's, I'm allowing myself to heal, you know? So, so I can't do it with you guys. You need to go. You just need to live your own lives out, whatever. I'm doing my thing, you know? But that's how incredibly damaging this stuff is. You know, because I cannot hang around with my dysfunctional family because they're in denial. They, you know, they just, they just, they think it's okay to abuse children. You know, like they don't think there's anything wrong with what my mother did to me. They actually find that my mother burned me, beat the shit out of me, you know, broke my nose practically, slapped me around, you know, um, beat the crap out of me with rolling pin, whatever she'd get in her hands, you know, spatulas, wooden spoons, whatever. You know, she's just always beating on me didn't matter what she could grab, get a hold of, whether it was her fists or her hands or whatever. And you know, just to the ill treatment, you know, calling me names and a whore and slut and cunt and everything else. I mean, from a small child. But they think that's fine. Nothing, you know, no problem. And that's incredibly wrong, you know, especially because I wasn't doing anything to warrant those beatings. No child is. I, you can't tell me that a child could do something even attitude-wise, a child's attitude could cause you to beat them with a rolling pin. You might want to. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because children can be pretty bad, you know, especially with their attitude. But the thing is, is that's not appropriate. You don't do that. You know what I mean? You find out. Well, the reason my... See, my mother made me pay for my attitude that she gave me. That's why I, I, I talk a lot about that, actually, about the issues of the... I had this chain, like what I, I felt like I had this necklace actually around my neck. And this necklace had all this stuff on it, this garbage that my parents had put there from years back, you know, hatred and, and anger, rage, you know, self self-loathing, self-sabotage stuff, all this horrible, horrible stuff hanging around my neck, you know. And I was just carrying this thing around, right, this load, this heavy load of, of evil and death and just horror, you know. And I thought this was given to me by my parents, by my mother, my dad, and my one of my siblings, and actually all of my siblings. Um, you know, and I'm wearing this stupid thing. It's not even mine. Like, I didn't do this to myself. Like, they did this to me. They they gave me this necklace full of, of horror and every every evil thing, you know. And I, I said, I'm taking that necklace off and I'm throwing it away. Stupid thing does not belong, belong to me. It doesn't belong to me. So I, I imagine myself taking this thing off and throwing it away. Because that was what, really, I mean, that's, my, my parents created me and then beat the shit out of me. They, they, made, they turned me into this child who, they turned me into what people would say is a bad child. They did. You know, because my parents were in my face saying, you know, like literally like cursing me and saying, go to hell and F you 
and, you know, you should have died. They were screaming at me and beating on me, you know, calling me names, horrible names. They did that for a period of 10 years or 11 years and turned me into them, you know. So by the time I was 10, 11 years old, I was acting just like them. I was like, F you, you know. And my attitude was just like theirs, you know. So by the time, you know, 13, 14 came around, my mother didn't like my attitude. She's like, look, you know, I can't deal with your attitude. I'm like, you created me, you know. You turned me into this. How? By beating the shit out of me, calling me names, hurting me, rejecting me, throwing me out of the house, spitting in my face, you know, slamming me into walls, you know, knocking my head into dryers. I mean, horrible, horrible things that could have killed me. You know, spilling my blood on a regular basis, slamming me around, slamming, slapping me across the face, literally beating me out in public, you know, like beating me with belts and stuff out in public, out in the front yard in the daylight, you know, with bloody traffic going by and, you know, horrible things, you know. And she turned me into this, you know, and then beat me more because of it, Yeah. So then my attitude was really bad because I was like, okay, you created me. You turned me into this. Now you're going to beat on me and make me pay for this and call me names and throw me out of the house and tell me that 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 that, uh, that I'm the only child that you're going to get rid of that you're going to throw out of the house, out of the, out of the six siblings who were worse than me, you know? So, I mean, literally, they, they turned me into what I was, right? which was a hateful child, you know? A hateful person. And then, you know, make me pay for that, right? You know, and my mother would never take responsibility. Like, never. It was all somebody else's fault. It was all somebody else's doing, you know? And she would never take responsibility. Never. And so, you know, I grew up very bitter, you know? And grew up because I couldn't get the love that I needed. I couldn't get anything I needed from those guys. You know, I got food. I got fed. You know, we had food, right? I had a place to sleep at night. I had a bed, you know. Like, I didn't have a very nice bed, and sometimes I didn't have a bed, actually. Sometimes I was on the floor. But that doesn't matter. You know, I had a roof over my head, stuff like this. But, you know, the the love was not there. The care was not there. Just this, it it was just this, you know, my mother was just like, I hate my children, I hate my husband, I hate my life, and I hate you talking to me, you know. And that was her attitude. And she expected us then to be able to thrive and grow in that. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> somewhere, somewhere along the line, you got some really bad parenting tips, you know. But my her, her my my grandmother's the whole responsibility for this because my grandmother completely, and people would say, okay, you know, abusers have no right to treat their children, you know, to, to do what they do to children just because they were abused. That's no excuse. And you know what? That's so true. I mean, my mother was abused terrifically by her mother. That's a fact, but. But the issue is, is and so were all the siblings, right? But the thing is, is that my grandmother, I mean, what a horrible woman. You know, actually, she's the only person that I don't have any love for in my heart, period. And, you know, God knows this, right? And I'm fine with it. Um, my grandmother, hate her, and I can't stand, I don't even allow anybody to talk about her around me, actually. But, um, you know, that's my mom's mom. But the thing is, is my mother didn't, my mother then became her mother, right? She didn't want to, but she did. And so, see, I could see myself. I could see my mom doing the same thing to me, turning me into her. So when I was young, I was just like my mother, especially when I was a young teenager. You know, I could hurt people, no problem, right? And I and I carried that attitude on right into my 20s. And I, I realized, wow, I'm just exactly like my mother. Hurtful, mean, horrible, rotten person, you know? And I thought, oh, my God, I don't want to be like that, you know what I mean? And it's taken me my whole life to get where I am today, uh, just to have love in my heart, just to re- to remember that we all need to be treated with respect and dignity. And, you know, it, this has been an incredible, horrible ride. You know, even though I've done some cool stuff, I've had some cool stuff happen in my lifetime, and I've got to, it's not that I'm not thankful for what the good things that I do have, you know. But what I, what I really want people, you know, and why I speak so publicly about child abuse and the issues is, because I want people to know what this does to people. I want people to know what domestic violence, secondhand domestic violence, child abuse, you know. I mean, my parents were brought up on charges. You know, they were, social workers were around. Did anything ever change? No. 
And these these people think that that this is going to happen today, that that abusive families and abusers are going to change just because social workers come in the picture for a couple of years? I don't think so. Because people who are bent on hateful, hate, hating each other, people that are bent on, on uh, using drugs and, and being hateful to their children their, or to their husbands or their partners, they're not going to change just because social workers are in the picture. The only way they're going to change is if they want to change inside their heart. You know, like my parents, when, when social workers came around, you know, she, they had to lay off a, few, a bit of the physical beatings and stuff like that because the, the social workers were checking, you know. But the thing is, is, is the fights were still on, you know. Their attitude really didn't change. And then when the social workers left, it was like a field day. It was like, right on, social workers are gone. Let's let's just have a big old family kick ass. And, you know, that's exactly what happened. And my parents started fighting again. Before, and then, after the social workers left is when my dad raped my mother in front of me. This was after the social workers were out of the, out of the picture. The abuse just got rampant, rampant, you know. And the sad thing is, is that, you know, nothing was done, <laughs> right? My parents were just allowed to treat us this way. And they were allowed to treat each other this way and be violent and, and trash the house and trash each other and trash the kids. You know, my dad was always beating up on my brothers and then slapping me around and hurt. You know, he did beat up on me, too, but not as bad as my brothers, of course. But my, you know, like my mom was my main abuser. But this is the kind of stuff. And then they wonder, you know, I look in the mirror today and I'm like, yeah, I'm the total sum of my experiences. So I know what it is to be evil, to be hurtful, to be... I also know what it is to be that little child, you know, living in fear and living in, in hatred, you know. I hated what was happening to my body. I hated what my parents were doing to me. And I hated what my my brother was doing to me, sexually abusing me. I hated my body. I hated my life. I hated my my whole existence. I hated it. And so by the time I was like, you know, 13, 14 years old, I was like wondering, where is God? <laughs> How could you let this happen, you know? And then one of my friends died, and my best friend actually is like my angel's protector friend from the time I was born. We were best friends. And because uh, we, we used to hang around when we were toddlers, she lived pretty well across the street from me. And she was my best friend ever. Well, she got killed in a, in a car, like a drunk driving accident, and got hit by a car, and she... She was gone out of my life, and I was sitting in the backyard just cursing God. <laughs> I was like, how could you take her? How could you take her? You know, and you leave me here in this house with this mother who hates my guts. And honest to God, I was sitting out in the backyard just crying and crying. And I was just cursing God because I was like, how could you leave me in this house with a mother who hates my guts, calls me a whore, you know, and spits in my face and beats the shit out of me and hates my guts. And a dad who doesn't care about anything but his own sexual needs. <laughs> and, you know, siblings who are just so screwed up, you know. And and a sibling that would that would rape me and use me sexually. How could you leave me in this, you know? Like I was sitting out in the backyard feeling even more rejected. Rejected by my parents, rejected by my family, rejected by society because society was looking down on me too. And rejected by God. <laughs> I mean, I was like, oh my God, this was like three, this was like, you know, five years after I was 10 and wanting to be dead. You know, five years later, I was sitting there just cursing God. I was like, you're going to take these people and you're not going to take me. You're going to take these people around me that I love and I care about. My brother was murdered. One of my brothers that I loved so dearly was murdered. And um, he was the only, actually, only one who would say any kind things to me and he didn't sexually use me. That's great. Um, you know, he's actually a decent guy. He used to try to protect my mother. And he got murdered when he was 19. And so, I mean, here's God taking people around me that that cared about me, that were good to me. You know, my friend was so good to me, my little friend who was my best friend for, you know, the 16, 17 years that we, were, that we hung around together since we were on the planet, which was about 16 years. Because I, um, I was just about turning 16 and she was turning 17. She was one year older than me, one year older. And she was like my protector angel friend and... You know, she was so good to me. She was the only one who would actually touch me in any kind of kind, loving way. Like, nobody was ever hugging me or holding me or actually soothing me. Like, my mother would just beat me. <laughs> my mother was like, get the hell away from me, you rotten kid. Slap me across the face. Send me to the floor. You know, and of course, I wouldn't hang around her too much because I didn't want to get beat on. But when I was really tiny, I'd try to get her to hug me. And I wanted to hold her. I wanted to hug her legs, you know. And she would, like, push me away. She would, like, push me down. She'd be, get away from me, you rape child. That's what she would say. 
And so I never, when I got older, obviously didn't try to come to give her a hug too much. I didn't want any contact with her because it was all bad. So I was like, okay. But this little friend of mine, she was, uh, that I grew up with, man, she was like my little angel buddy. And like she would just, she would actually pat me on the arm and do these like little soothing things, you know, because she knew I was suffering. And, um, you know, she knew I was messed up. And I think she was put here just for me. I really do. Sometimes I think about that. I'm like, well, I think she was in my life. I think God allowed her to come into the world for me. You know? Like, what a special gift. Like, so if, when I was younger, of course, I had a problem with losing her. I, I, of course, I was hurt by it. But as I got older, I realized, what a gift, you know? She was totally a gift in my life that, you know, I needed at the time. And I will never, ever forget. You know, she she was a beautiful person, for sure. But, yeah, this is this is just it, you know? I have to look at this stuff every day. And know that I'm the end result of all this stuff, right? And that a lot of the choices and, and and behaviors that I that I that I that I have, a lot of choices that I make, these behaviors that I have, you know, relationship issues, and just anything else in life, and this, you know, this cynical attitude is really a result of of this child who's been so so unloved, so unwanted, and so mistreated, you know, and so horrifically abused, and having to grow up in in really what I consider to be hell, you know. And so I have to face this stuff every day. So what Robert Bernie, you know, when he's saying, like he says, you know, he's sobbing for that little boy, that emotional trauma that he experienced. But he was also sobbing for the man that he became. I mean, honest to God, like that's what I'm, you know, that's what I've been doing for the last four and a half years. Because I was sitting on the couch ready to kill myself four and a half years ago. I was ready to self-injure anyway. And I was planning my suicide. I was thinking, okay, I got, I, how long can I d- deal with this pain? How long can I... How long can I suffer this, you know? How long can I how long can I actually allow myself to be in so much pain? I just couldn't take it, you know. And I didn't want to kill myself, you know. Like I really didn't. And I um because one of my siblings had killed himself, the one who sexually abused me. But the thing is is I, I you know, and I knew what it did to the family, the family was already ripped apart, you know. And then to have that happen, right, it was horrible. But of course, I didn't think too much about it because I didn't care about him because he raped and sodomized me. I was like, whatever, the guy just hurt me, you know, and I never got I never got any restitution from that. And so, I mean, at the time, I wasn't all that upset that he killed himself. I was mainly mad at my parents because of what they did to all of us, you know. And, uh, you know, it's, I didn't want to kill myself. But the issue is, it's like, I wanted out of this pain. And so I was sitting there on the couch, you know, four and a half years ago thinking, how am I going to do this? You know, I need to change this. I need to change what my parents did to me. I need to change this 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 bad attitude that I've got. I need to change these behaviors. I need to want to live. You know, I need to want to to be well, to get to get well, to be healthy. I deserve it, just like everybody else. I deserve the opportunity, you know, to heal, to have a good life, to you know, to be able to be an adult here on the planet and take care of things when they need to be taken care of. You know. And, and like you know, like some people really have a hard time coping with this stuff. You know, if you're not shown as a child, if you're not shown through your life how to do this, you have to figure it out yourself. And it's not easy, you know what I mean? And so I thought, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to fight this, and I'm going to win. Because it really, what I it was like, it was really my way of getting back at my parents. Really, by saying, you know what, you can't kill me. You can't. You, they couldn't kill me. <laughs> and so that makes me laugh because every time I think about it, I laugh because I'm like, right on. You know, because they tried really hard to destroy me. They destroyed everybody else in my family pretty well. And I'm like, they couldn't do it, you know. And that's that's a good, good feeling for me. You know, because even, even though I still have so much work to do, and, um, you know, I need to find that joy. I need to find that place. Once I grieve, properly grieve all this stuff, I believe that I will feel so much better. I probably won't even recognize myself, you know. <clears throat> because I'm living, I've been living this way forever. So I'm kind of a little bit interested to meet myself, you know, to meet my real self. It's really going to be quite interesting to see what happens there. Um, because I think it will be a transformation. I really do. Um, but, the, it, you know, until that happens, right, I, I really don't have any idea who I really, who I am. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> not that, not that pure self of myself, right? Because I've been, I've been living this way for so long, you know. But I know that inside of there, is, is a person who can feel love, who can feel joy, who understands love and understands joy. 
And under, that's why I, I'm, I'm out here fighting to stop child abuse and fighting to stop abuses, really. Uh, because it's wrong. Part, that, that, that internal part of me that says that we should be loving each other, that we should be good to each other. That, that you know, because I'm looking at this as, you know, very simply, that my parents should have loved each other, right? And if we think about this and go back to simple, you know, A plus, you know, A, A, B, C, or 1 plus 1 is 2, right? Um, then we can see that, you know, that people shouldn't be hurting each other. This is absolutely ridiculous. If I want to go back and look at it, I can say my parents should not have been hurting each other. And they should not have done what they did to their children. And they should not have 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 set us up for this life of misery and hell. That was their responsibility, and they did this. And they have to answer for it. Well, you know, and they'll answer for it in the judgment. I totally, totally believe that. But the issue is, is that you can't go back and change it. It's done. So now I have to learn how to, to find that, to, to first of all feel it, you know, see it, feel it, grieve it, be there in the moment, allow myself to deal with what I didn't deal with as a child, and then eventually find that 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 true self of myself that I that I always have been underneath of all this stuff, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is going. <clears throat> yeah, that's talking for an hour. I'm not quite used to that, but um. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I really appreciate it. My good friend Gypsy, which is still here, and that's quite a few guests earlier. But, yeah, this is, um, you know, this process, like Robert Bernie says, until we actually do it, you know, we can't really we, we, we can't really work through it. We need to learn how to do this stuff, you know. These, we have to go through these layers. And that's why I always say, you know, if you're, you've got to be sure you can do the work, the inner child healing work, before you start it. Um, like, be very, very careful, because I know... Like, I know myself looking back at some of the stuff is so painful, so incredibly painful. And I know the stuff, I'm just doing my inner infant now. I'll be talking about that later on, probably um, like Thursday or Saturday. But I'm working through the inner infant and the inner toddler work. and That's not too bad, but when I start getting into the preschool and the, and the school age and the adolescent stuff, I'm going to have to go back and revisit a lot of that painful stuff. And so, you know, I know that I'll be okay to do it, right? But, you you know, you have to be very careful when you're doing this work because what it does, it takes you right back into it. And, you know, if you, you have to be sure that you're safe enough to do it. Right? And so, you know, I, I really, yeah, hopefully you're getting something out of this. I know I am. <clears throat> My voice is just terrible this morning, though. But Robert Bernie, we'll continue on um, Thursday taking a look through this article here at some of these quotes. You know, he's got a whole lot of great information. That's www.joyteenyou. That's J O Y. The number two meu dot com and um, Robert Bernie and he's this is processing two the the second part of those inner child healing processing articles that he wrote processing part two and this is pretty well almost the end of the inner child healing work and then what I thought I might do is just begin to look at I want to finish up a few pages here that I saw that were quite interesting to do with inner child healing work. And then I want to move on and sort of start working through what I'm going through with the inner child healing work with John Bradshaw's work, um, taking a look at that, because that's really is where I'm at. I'm actually working through the workbooks, and it's quite interesting to see the process and see what happens um, when you actually go back in and actually get a hold of that inner child and and communicate with that inner child, you know, who, who really is just me at these different age age groups, right? It's not like I'm somebody else in there. Like, I mean, it's just me. So it's quite interesting to get a hold of that stuff, um, you know. And I'm I'm still working through, obviously. Like I just started, so and this has been only a few months that I just started doing the work on it. So I kind of wanted to sort of switch over, and we'll we'll do that sometime, probably like this week, maybe Thursday or Saturday. So I'll be back on uh, tomorrow night. Child abuse prevention is up to us for for an hour, and then I'll be back on Thursday morning, same time, same place, six to seven, um, with one child abuse one child abuse over to another. So thanks everybody for being here. I appreciate it, and you know, have a great day. <clears throat> And if you, you know, like I always say on every single show, like if you're having a hard time coping, you know, and you just think, oh, my God, I just can't, you know, I can't do this, I can't deal. You know, you call a crisis line. You do whatever you have to do. You call a friend, but if you can't get a hold of a friend or your therapist or your counselor or somebody, then you call a crisis line. But you do something, you stay alive, you get yourself some help. And that's just a, you make that a mission, you know, to get help, and you know, to not allow yourself to spiral downward and, to not allow yourself to hurt yourself or self-sabotage, self-injure, you know, you make sure you get some help, you know. Like, I, I'm, you know, I can't say that enough because we deserve to stick around. We deserve to have a good life. 
But if we don't if we don't stick around, it won't happen. And it, some of the days are hard, that's for sure. Some of the nights are hard. And some of them are just downright undoable. <laughs> it's like, man, I don't know if I can do today, you know. But we can. That's the whole issue, right? And there's too many people out here who have proven this to me. You know, stick around, make the right choice for yourself. Allow yourself to get some help, whatever help it is that works for you, you know. But make some, make some good choices and make these choices for yourself. We have to do this. It is literally up to us, right? So thanks, everybody, for being here and appreciate it and for Gypsy Witch for sticking around and being here for almost every single show. I know that. Um, <clears throat> have a great day, everybody, and we'll talk to you tomorrow night. Bye-bye.